with this. All right. Hi, everybody. So I think what we're going to do, um, because technology is complex, is we're going to just proceed and I'm going to introduce you There we go. Uh, a lot of the wildflowers. And uh, to give you a little bit of background about uh, how I got into this and uh, tell you a little bit more about the book and also tell you a little bit about uh, how you can bring more wildflowers into your own landscape. And uh, so that's, that's a great deal to cover in about 40 minutes. So we'll launch into it. So. Um, my husband and I started Wildflower Farm back in 1988. Uh, originally, Wildflower Farm was uh, first a uh, dried flower production company, and then we became Canada's first pick-your-own-flower farm. And uh, this is when our farm was in Schaumburg, uh, where we were for 18 years. And then 18 years ago, we moved up into the cold water area. And uh, for 25 years, we ran both at both at each of these locations successively, we ran uh, a wildflower nursery and destination point. And then nine years ago, uh, kind of ahead of the curve, we decided that um, we had had 25 years of working seven days a week and decided to emphasize our uh, website and our seed sales, which had been going on for 21 years. My husband designed our website and uh, it's been selling wildflower seeds, native grasses, meadow mixes, and our low maintenance turf grass Ecolon for 21 years throughout North America, which is really kind of extraordinary <laughs> to think about it. Um, Originally, Wildflower Farm had was a destination point, was a garden center. We also had a landscaping division. And uh, I guess about seven years ago, um, yeah, seven, six, seven years ago, I decided that I wanted to write a book because uh, there are certainly lots and lots of great books about wildflowers. Um, and I think I probably have read all of them. But to my personal point of view, that there, there were pieces missing that I felt that I could provide, things that I personally uh, have been in, interested in, 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 for example, the use of wildflowers as cut flowers and floral design work using native plants. Um, that's one example. Also, I love growing things from seed. The beginning of my book, Taming Wildflowers, uh, there's an entire beginning chapter, which is really kind of a, a memoir about how I got into uh, doing this work. And I just, I, it started out because I love growing stuff from seed. I still love that process. And so I just grew everything I could from seed. And then over time, uh, we realized that we had become specialists in wildflowers. It, it, it happened very serendipitously in that... Um, we, we just kept getting asked to, to for pe people wanted us to grow wildflowers. I had placed wildflower landscapes around our shop uh, because they were low maintenance and easy to take care of. And I felt that uh, they just would be less work. <laughs> Um, they're very beautiful, but I, I didn't know anyone else would be interested. And it turns out people were. And before we knew it, we had taught ourselves a lot about wildflowers and the history of wildflowers in North America. Um, the thing is, wildflowers have been here for thousands and it's very important to understand a basic working definition of wildflowers. Wildflowers, by my definition, are plants that were here prior to European settlement. Um, and that's an important factor because wildflowers and all of the pollinators and the beneficial insects literally have evolved together for many, 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 many centuries. 
And that means that they depend upon each other. And it means that making a very long story short, and I have a big chapter on the importance of pollinators and wildflowers in the book. Uh, but what it means is that over 75% of all of the food that, that you and I as humans take in requires pollination. And if we don't feed the pollinators, the food that they grew up uh, through centuries and centuries and centuries requiring, then, then they fade out. If we, if we destroy the environment that they live in to do, build new houses, to do all kinds of different things, uh, even to farm, then uh, they will disappear. So there's been a huge resurgence of wildflowers um, and an interest in wildflower landscaping uh, for so many important reasons. Uh, one more thing about food security, and then I'll move on to the flowers themselves. Um, so there was a really interesting study done about five years ago, uh, I believe at Yale University, uh, that studied over a period of years, a number of different types of farms, blueberry farms, uh, vegetable farms of many kinds. And they, uh, the study was all about the farmers putting in swaths of wildflower meadows. They wouldn't do these on major pieces of working land that they needed to grow food and make money from. They would put them on, you know, just side drifts that were on their property. And these were large swaths that had been just sitting empty. And these wildflower meadows worked very hard for the benefit of these farmers in some very tangible ways. Um, first of all, what they found that the, was that these wildflower meadows attracted all the pollinators. So everything got pollinated very efficiently and it attracted the native pollinators who, who, who pollinate more efficiently than the European honeybees. Now I love European honeybees. I have bees on my property, um, but the native bees are far more efficient in their pollination procedures. Um, also, um, these swaths attracted beneficial bugs and these beneficial bugs fought and won and conquered all the bad bugs. So many of these bad bugs were conquered by the beneficial insects that over 75 or actually 80% uh, reduction in pesticide use was required by these farmers, 80%. Um, plus, interestingly enough, the native pollinators not only pollinated everything efficiently, they actually helped the vegetables produce better quality crops, larger, better tasting, really fascinating. So there's a lot of very specific benefits to wildflowers for public and private landscapes. So, um, but I particularly, because I just love flowers, I got into, uh, floral design work and I also because I grow things from things from seed I put in the book pictures of wildflower seedlings you know when you are gardening and you're out on on your knees or maybe you're using one of those very cool Dutch uh, hose that you can stand up and do the same work in any case I could do a whole talk on that but you're trying to identify things in your garden and it's very helpful to know what seedlings look like. Because of course, if they were all in flower form, you could more easily identify them. So I also wanted to attract young people with my book um, because I wanted them to really learn about wildflowers. And so I put in three different chapters on weddings, DIY weddings. And I found three fabulous brides and um, they all had very different aesthetics and backgrounds and they all 
uh, learned how to make their own floral designs. They went out and harvested flowers from here at the farm uh, with their wedding posse. Uh, and uh, they designed all the flowers with their bridal parties and moms and cousins and such. And I'm still friends with quite a few of them, which has been absolutely wonderful. And um, so that was important to me um, to make it a very human experience. And so that was really neat. And actually, just as an aside for Aurelians, uh, one of the brides actually moved to Aurelia in the past couple of years. And she lives here and she's a fabulous artist and musician. But what we're gonna do next is we are going to meet some of these plants, these flowers. This is what's in bloom now. Obviously, if, if we were together a month ago, it would have been a different cast of characters. In another month, it'll be an entirely different group of plants, which is what makes it very, very exciting. So I'm going to start with, uh, let's see, who am I gonna start with? Here's, here's a great place to start. Okay, whoa, this is heavy. Okay. I'm starting with two of my super favorite wildflowers. This yellow fellow is oxeye sunflower. The Latin on that, oh, by the way, you're welcome to take notes. And of course, you'll find a lot of this information in the book. You'll also find a lot of this information on the wildflowerfarm.com website, which is a veritable encyclopedia of wildflower gardening for gardens and meadows seeds, seed mixes, how to do everything. So both of these resources will, will get you a long way. Um, but we have here oxeye sunflower and the, the Latin on that is Heliopsis helianthoides. And uh, the, which for those of you who are familiar with root words, and we are, we are having a talk through the library, Helios means sun, right? So Heliopsis, plants of the sun. This is a perennial native sunflower. Perennial native sunflower, oxeye sunflower. It's one of the common names for it. And uh, obviously it blooms midsummer. Here we have a really unusual wildflower and it is called wild quinine. It was used as a substitute for quinine. It is not quinine. During, I think, World War I, it was used as a substitute for quinine. Um, it has very hard, dense flowers. So if I squish them, nothing happens. And uh, they're beautiful seed heads. I mean, um, flower heads, absolutely gorgeous. Um, one of my brides really liked soft, soft colors, whites and soft mauves and lavenders and things. And she used this primarily in her bridal bouquet because of the whiteness of it and the softness of the color. Um, it's, this is a fabulous plant in full sun or part shade, and it grows in sandy soil, loam or clay, as does ox eye sunflower. These are, these are both really beautiful and easy plants to grow. We will talk about seeds a little bit too, if you would like. Um, so that's this group of plants. All right. Now, most people are familiar with purple cone flower. Here's purple cone flower, which of course is featured on the cover of my book, which is actually our production field, um, which is basically over there. <laughs> and um, this is a cousin. This is pale purple cone flower. This guy's these guys are just about finished. They start earlier in their bloom cycle, but you can still see the formation and I love their big fat seed heads. They're really quite, quite neat looking. And there are other echinaceas as well. Um, right now I don't have any to show you, but you will find that there are more. There's a bright yellow, giant brown headed paradoxa. Um, and then there's a, a, a shorter one called Tennesseeensis as well. But here you see this beautiful, soft, lacy background material. That is jopi weed, 
before it actually blooms and turns pink. But it's beautiful in arrangements like this. And then we also have, there's a plant that's pretty popular in the general knowledge of things, a spiderwort or Tratus cancia. And um, normally it blooms in the morning, but I've gotten a few of these guys to, uh, to bloom uh, in, in the evening. I don't know how I persuaded them, but anyway, so they, they're really quite lovely. Okay, now. While we're on the topic of cone flowers, these are yellow cone flowers. And even though they structurally look like they are uh, echinaceas, they're not. These are actually uh, Retibida pinnata. Um, they look like echinaceas. They're kind of an honorary echinacea, but uh, they're really quite lovely. They get pretty tall and uh, they get to about three, three and a half, sometimes up to four feet tall. And they grow in sandy soil, loam or clay. And uh, they, I love their very thin stems. They're really quite fabulous. Okay, now here's two purple plants. One right here, this is Monarda. Monarda has three names, Monarda, Bee bomb, um, or where's my brain? Yeah, I'll think of the third one. <laughs> it's the evening. Um, these smell kind of minty. And in fact, they are in the mint family. You can tell that because they have square stems and they smell absolutely fabulous. You can make a tea with them. Um, Monarda fistulosa. Now, one of the things I like to do with floral design work is use plants in different phases. These guys are just opening up. Hang on, I'll get one that's still closed. They're just opening up, but the form is beautiful. And they, they just look really, the shape is really neat. Yeah, wild bergamot. Thank you, Rebecca. Bergamot, Monarda. Yeah, bee bomb. Yes, exactly. And uh, they're just a beautiful formation. See that? Yeah. Also, in the same color realm, we have Agastache, commonly known as um, Agastache, uh, a hyssop, hyssop, licorice hyssop or purple hyssop. And oh, there's a little pollinator enjoying that. I don't know if you can see that little guy on there. <laughs> anyway, so um, this smells and tastes exactly like licorice and um, it's quite fabulous and the, the First Nations people used it as a tea quite often. Um, you can also eat the leaves if you wanted, put them in a salad for a kind of licorice taste in a salad. Yep. Then I think what we're going to do is we're going to take a walk down to one of the gardens that is closest to where we are right now. And uh, so I'm gonna pick you up and take you over there so that we can see some of the wildflowers growing. Is I've got, uh, for a special treat, I've got red milkweed and bright orange butterfly weed still in bloom. Uh, in this garden, as well as some other really cool things to see. So hang on, I'm gonna pick you up and move you and it'll be a little bumpy for a moment, okay? Um, we're gonna get to the white container. The white container, which white container? I don't see a white container. This one we talked about. This one you mean, we're gonna get to that. And then there's another one over here, but I thought we'd come back. I thought we'd get up and walk around for a few minutes and then finish up what's here. Okie doke, good. All right, so I'm gonna pick you up and close my tripod and we're gonna move you over. I'm about to turn you around. Here we go, here we go. So here you see uh, one of my, one of the many gardens around here. Okay, I'll try not to give you vertigo. So right here you see some 
licorice hyssop growing. We were just talking about that. Doing beautifully right there. It's very, uh, I find that in our zone, um, it self sows nicely and makes clumps, but isn't really a true perennial. But I, I just let it spread around and edit out what I don't want. Right next to it, its neighbor, just coming into bloom here is great blue lobelia. You can see that it blooms from the bottom to the top. And the top is not yet in bloom, but it's going to be gorgeous. That's such a beautiful blue. Then uh, the next small wildflower right there is uh, mountain mint. See the little white guy there next to the lily? That's mountain mint. And right here, just finishing up, we have bright orange butterfly weed. Now you can see they're finished, but you can still see the color. Quite lovely. Now, right over here, we have wild quinine gracing the garden, quite lovely. And then way over there, I love having this tripod. I can get right on top of things. That is red milkweed. Oh, there's a beautiful pollinator. That's probably a wasp, but he's a good wasp. He's a pollinator. And right here, the, the, the Liatris is coming into bloom. That's uh, Liatris spicata right there. So we're gonna walk around, oops, try not to make you dizzy, to the other side to focus on a, another beautiful stand of Liatris. This is Liatris pycnostachia. Yep, there's a monarch on the milkweed, yep. That's correct. Yes, lots and lots. We get lots and lots of uh, visitors coming and it's absolutely fabulous. So that gives you, oh, there's one more little treat. Oops, sorry. I'm going to share with you, which is right here. You see these guys? Those are nodding wild onions. Now they have pink flowers and they're not happening yet in another week or so. But the formation and the way they droop their necks, I love, absolutely love. Now, one of the things I talk about a lot in the book is what the babies look like. Here is butterfly weed that I grew myself. Now, these are new, new plants that I just planted out in this garden a couple of weeks ago. And next year, they will bloom. Yeah, so that gives you some idea. And as you can see, my garden is not exclusively native, right? I'm not a purist. I don't believe that uh, we should only grow native plants. I'm not an extremist. But I do think, as I mentioned to you, that it's really important that you grow a lot of native plants in your garden, but you include them in your garden. Here we are back again. Now let us continue our tour. Um, now, here, here we go. This is a really interesting arrangement. We've got a lot of really special plants here. This is Rattlesnake Master. Now, many of you, if you garden, are probably familiar with sea hollies, the blue sea hollies. This is the ancient ancestor of the sea holly. It's also an eryngium. This is eryngium yuccafolium because the leaves look like yucca leaves. Um, that's why it was named that way. And it's a great plant. Uh, it stays in bloom all season long. And it... Um, the structural elements are fabulous. It gets to be about three, two and a half, three feet tall. And I just love that sort of glowing gray and it's very textural as well. Now, 
here, I'm going to pull one out so you can see it. Whoops, whoops. I got two out. Hang on. He's, he's for next time. I'm going to talk about him in a minute. This looks like a giant oak leaf, doesn't it? It looks like a giant oak leaf, not an oak leaf. This is actually um, compass plant, which is in the Silphium family. Great word, Silphium. S-I-L, uh, F-I-U-M, I believe. Anyway, this has a rough texture and it, the leaves are huge and they actually have iron in them and the iron aligns with the ground and the plant lines up north south which is why it's called the compass plant yes the leaves line up north south super cool eh the this is an ancient prairie plant and the the flowers go up on a stem that is six eight ten feet tall sometimes they're yellow flowers and i i didn't bring any of those but you can certainly see them in the book and you can see them on the website. You can grow them for yourself. They're super cool. Neat, eh? Um, these guys, come on. These guys are both different phases of a type of goldenrod that um, is fantastic for pollinators, exquisite for the garden and uh, also very beautiful as fill in arrangements. This is called uh, Solidago rigida or stiff goldenrod. Here's a younger plant that hasn't opened up yet. And so this is pre-bloom, both of these. This one will turn yellow and it's just beautiful as a filler in floral arrangements. Then we have uh, right here, this is, um, Big blue stem, the native grass. Big blue stem and little blue stem are both gorgeous native grasses. There's lots of gorgeous native grasses. Big blue stem gets about six, eight feet tall. And when it's in bloom, the blooms look like this, which looks like a turkey claw. And that's a good way to identify them. Um, also the blades, can't really see here, but. The blades are kind of turquoisey and green, very exquisite and a little bit blue, thus the name Big Blue Stem. Very beautiful. Finally, last but not least, Silver King Artemisia in the back here. Just a beautiful, beautiful plant to have in the garden and also in floral arrangements. An absolute favorite to work with. Okay, then I have a container of cool, unusual stuff. Super unusual. Okay, now these guys are not necessarily cut flowers, okay? So they're not going to give you a great visual show, but what this is is wine cups and it's, it's getting dark. So it, the cup has closed. Uh, it opens up wider to the sun. And um, wine cups is, in Latin on that is calero and volucrata. And it's actually, as I said, not a cut flower. It's actually a ground cover or uh, a great plant to use in the rockery or a scree garden. It likes pure gravel, pure gravel and super dry conditions. And uh, so that's what this is, wine cups. Here's a, here's a little wine cup that I just want to show you this. Um, they can often very much look like rosebuds. Isn't that just lovely? Yeah. Um, so now here's another great plant. This is a, called Verbena Hasta, Verbena Hasta. Or, and it's, these are beautiful, uh, no, this is Verbena stricta, pardon me. These get tall and they like very moist conditions, medium to moist conditions. And they get about four to five feet tall. Very pretty spikes. 
Now I'm going to show you something super cool. This is purple poppy mallow. Neat, eh? They look like capsules with little tutus. Capsules with little tutus. These are, are purple prairie clover or Dahlia purpurea. And these are amazing in arrangements. They also dry really well. You'll, there's a chapter in Taming Wildflowers about making wildflower wreaths. And these are featured in there along with some other beautiful wildflowers because they, uh, they happen to dry quite vividly and the color is retained. You can see if you look really closely, uh, you might be able to see it, the little bits of gold on there. Yeah, so it's purple flecked with gold. And these get to be about ooh, one and a half to two feet tall. They're really quite beautiful. And um, they're in the legume family, which means they return nitrogen to the soil. Okay, and I've got a couple more here. Again, it's evening, so these guys are asleep. Um, does, oh, can you repeat the question? Does Rattlesnake Master what? I missed it. I can answer it now. Dry um, nicely. Does it dry nicely? Yes. 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 It is nice in arrangements um, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Now in the book, I, I feature 60 of my favorite wildflowers and native grasses in order that they bloom. And each of the wildflowers has its own page, which has all the different um, characteristics of them, including which ones dry well, which ones work well in containers, what they look like as seedlings, all kinds of different things like that. Of course, the conditions they grow best in. This guy, he's kind of finished blooming, but I couldn't, I couldn't bear not to bring him. This is wild petunia or ruelia. Yes, you can see he's really a lovely purple color. Yeah, he's a morning guy. He's finished for the day. But uh, again, this is not really a cut flower but it is an amazing flower for very dry conditions, rock gardens, free conditions. And last but not least, this is a kind of black-eyed Susan. Here we are. This is a kind of black-eyed Susan. It's different. Oh, no, oh I have one more, I forgot. Uh, I, this is different than the regular, pardon my back, Black-Eyed Susan. Here's the regular Black-Eyed Susan that you're familiar with, Rudbeckia herta. This is Rudbeckia subtomentosa, or sweet Black-Eyed Susan. This Black-Eyed Susan that most of us are familiar with, we think of as a perennial, meaning that it comes back every year because it's, it sows its seeds so readily that it's always around, but it actually isn't a stable perennial. It is unstable, but this one is a true perennial, sweet black-eyed Susan. It's about a three, three and a half feet tall, blooms, starting to bloom this time of year, just beginning. It's really more late summer, early fall, and it's fabulous. It has big fat heads. This is an early one, so the head is actually smaller. They get bigger. I wanted to make sure you, you saw that one. And then definitely a morning plant. This is flax. It has blue flowers, which by this time of the evening have dropped off. And then it makes new blue flowers every morning. There's actually a couple of buds on there, little tiny ones for tomorrow morning. Yeah. And I use uh, the flax in the front of my borders. It looks so lovely and pretty. So. Let's go with this one. Okay. <laughs> all right. So here we have, first of all, we, we were talking about this before. This is stiff goldenrod. You can see what a beautiful filler it is in that arrangement. And then we have, as we discussed, black eyed Susan, um, or this would be 
the Latin on it is Rudbeckia herta. Herta means fuzzy in Latin. And actually, if you're up close and personal with them, you can see and feel that their leaves are fuzzy. So that's a good way to remember it. Now I'm going to pull out this guy. This is Baptisia or blue false indigo. And it blooms in June. And this time of year, it's been forming big fat seed pods. The bloom on it is big fat blue spikes that are fabulous and very important for the, the uh, bumblebees. And uh, this is not a great example. It's, it's been chewed by some of our friends, but um, it actually does tend to have very beautiful foliage that is great in arrangements. Yeah, you can see this one behind right there. That's more attractive. It looks kind of like eucalyptus leaves. Okay, here's another beauty. This is a uh, culver's root. And this one's just finishing up on the top. You can see the white spike. That's quite beautiful. And these are, oh, five, four and a half, five feet tall, beautiful white spires. Absolutely gorgeous. I have some in my meadows and they look amazing. Okay, so who is this colorful guy? Who is this? Uh, can you cut from the Baptisia with, I can't see the whole question. A Coryopsis? Pardon? So the Baptisia, the mm -hmm. Baptisia, if you have just one plant and you cut whole um, branches You mean from divide it? it? No, just if you cut for it for arrangements, will that kill the plant? Oh, no. No. Okay. Like how much of it can you cut, I guess, and still have it come back the next year? Uh, cutting a flower has very little, if nothing, to do with the viability of the plant moving forward. Got it. I meant the foliage. Oh, yeah. oh, the foliage. Um, sure, you can take a bit of it. I mean, obviously, you don't want to strip it because it needs the photosynthesis. But you can, the thing is, Baptisia, um, this is a Baptisia australis, the blue one. Um, these guys, as they mature, they get to be like shrubs. They're huge. So if you want to take off some foliage, it's not a big deal at all. It's absolutely fine. Um, yes, that's, the question was about Coryopsis. Yes, we didn't talk about the Coryopsis. This is Coryopsis. Somebody has a sharp eye. This is Coryopsis. Yeah, mostly they're earlier bloomers. I did find a few to, to show you. Yeah, they're only about one and a half to one and three quarters feet tall. And they bloom in late spring, usually around the same time as the, the blue false indigo. There are other kinds of Baptisias or, um, in, they're not called indigos, Baptisias. Um, there are yellow ones. There are white ones, white ones as well. And um, they, uh, they are fabulous and beautiful and elegant and tall with purple stem. So that's this guy. Yeah, we're gonna do this guy next. Yes, that's where I was going. <laughs> I, I love hearing, I love seeing the chats, you know, it's good. Okay, so um, we're gonna talk about this plant next. This is Gallardia or blanket flower, and it isn't native to Ontario, um, but it does well here. And um, yes, you can deadhead the blanket flowers uh, or Gallardias, and they will keep blooming right up till the time that frost comes in. Um, if you want to, which is a great thing to do to keep the color in your garden um, late in the season. Now, one of the things that, that I want to talk about next is later in the season and why wildflowers are important um, to have in the garden for all the different seasons. So um, going back to monarchs and milkweed as a great example, um, many of us are familiar with the fact that monarchs 
and milkweed have this very important synergistic relationship. The monarchs lay their eggs only on the milkweeds and the, um, they eat the milkweed leaves, the caterpillars when they, when they first emerge. And then the butterflies also, of course, enjoy the nectar of the milkweeds. Um, but milkweeds last only a number of few more weeks into the summer. They don't last all uh, the time into the fall. So what is a monarch or other pollinators to do then? They have relationships with other plants like the liatris, the asters, the goldenrods, um, all the native goldenrods that we carry that I grow here for their seed, they are filled with pollinators in the fall. They're just super popular. Um, people often ask me, what, what about Canada goldenrod? It's very aggressive. We don't grow Canada goldenrod. We don't sell Canada goldenrod. It is a pig. It is very aggressive. It is native. Uh, but it, it doesn't need anybody's help. Uh, we don't help it along. Um, the other goldenrods are much more polite and really very garden worthy. Um, the Europeans use them a lot in their gardens as well. And um, it's not the goldenrods that cause allergies. It's the ragweed. You don't really even notice that in bloom at the same time. Goldenrod actually spreads its pollen only via pollinator, not through the air. So it gets blamed for a lot of things that it really shouldn't get blamed for. Um, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, some of what uh, we do. I did want to talk about seeds a little bit. Um, so we grow fields and fields of wildflowers uh, for seed production. We harvest the seed we clean the seed and we package the seed and we sell it all over North America. Now, there are two kinds or two categories of, of seeds. One that are for these perennial plants we're talking about, which means they come back year after year and you only seed them once and then they will return. Um, the first category is called, we call sow and grow. And that means, pardon me, that you can start these without them going through winter. They can go through winter, you can start them this fall, um, but in the ground, but many wildflowers, not all, um, require something called cold moist stratification which is basically they need to go through winter. Essentially, they have to go through a number of freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw cycles so that the hard shell on the seed breaks down and then you add moisture and warmth and the seed is programmed to grow. Um, but there are many great techniques you can use to grow flowers from seed, whether you have the sow and grow or that second category. Um, on the website, there's a lot of information and I have videos that I made there about different techniques to grow wildflowers from seed. It's not difficult. Um, if you're interested in growing individual species, we, you know, we give you all the detailed instructions. If you're interested in meadows, then we also provide on the website and with the seeds you order, um, detailed instructions about that process and how to actually do that, that successfully. A lot of people think, and I thought this many, many years ago, like 30 years ago, uh, the first year I, yeah, like the third, second or third year we moved to the country um, in Schomburg from Toronto. I thought, oh, I want a wildflower meadow. I want, it's gonna be so beautiful. And I bought this big bag of seeds and it said, Northeast wildflower meadow mix. And it had these really pretty pictures on it. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. And we, we begged a neighbor to plow an area and he came over. We didn't have a tractor then. And um, we sowed the seed and it, I, I was so excited. And the first year I was okay. 
second year, some flowers, some thistles. By the third year, it was a disaster. And that taught us that there, that that was obviously not the correct approach. And so we set out to learn the real methods uh, to grow wildflower meadows and learn about wildflowers in general. And that's what really set us on this path. So um, I'm happy to answer questions and um, hear from people. Uh, if people would like to ask any questions about the wildflower seeds, the individual species, meadows, or about our eco lawn, um, or anything you want to know about me or the book or anything like that. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, there are some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you use the term wildflowers rather than native flowers? Um, well, you, there's a lot of terms that all say the same thing. You can say indigenous uh, fl plants, you can say native plants, you can say wildflowers. As long as you have the a, a, a definition that is correct, then it, it becomes, uh, to me, just a matter of choice. Um, again, my definition of a wildflower or a native plant or an indigenous plant are plants that were growing here prior to your European settlement. Okay, great. Um, if you use the Joe Pye weed when it is closed and white, does it open and show pink in the vase? Depending on when you harvest it. Um, in general, with flower harvests for floral design, um, there's a real art to when to harvest things um, to get the effect you want. Um, so that's a complex question. If it's just about to open and it's been hot and you know, it's progressing well, it will sometimes open for you. If it's early on, then definitely not. Um, yeah, so. Okay, um, I have had blue false indigo plants for three years. They have vigorous foliage and I have never had any blooms. Any tips? Okay, never, it never is your key word there because blue false indigos regularly and traditionally do not bloom until at least their third year. So you are fine. You just have to be patient. Okay. Um, any other questions? I think I've got them all from, oh, here comes another one. Oh, someone said yay. <laughs> <laughs> the person yay. about the blue folks. Okay. Uh, sow and grow is one type of seed. What is the second? Okay. Good, good, good catch there. Um, anything that needs to be cold, moist, stratified is the second category. And there are a bunch of methods and in my PowerPoint and also on the website, you will um, you find all these kinds of things. In other words, you can, you have a choice. You can, if you choose just plant a seed in the ground um, and let winter do the work. Make sure you note where you put it and what when you planted it, and what species it is and all that stuff because you can easily forget. Or you can plant seeds in pots and put them outside and let winter do their thing. Or there's several indoor methods that you can use to cheat. One, you can, this is the old method you can put the seeds in um, moistened growing medium um, and label it, date it and all that stuff and leave it in the refrigerator or the freezer for three months and then take it out and plant it. Or you can use what we call the speed dial method. And that's my favorite video. And what, what it's, a, it, it's a video of me 
oops, I lost me. It's a video of me. Can you see me or are we, are we good? Yep, we're good. Oh, okay. There's Jane, hi. <laughs> um, a video uh, of me uh, putting the, the moist growing medium in the seeds labeled in the refrigerator for one day. And then the next day, putting it in the freezer and going back and forth for seven days between the refrigerator and the freezer. And that cold the freeze thaw method will give you uh, successful cold moist stratification. Great. Um, someone is asking favorite cut wildflowers for containers on a windy balcony with morning sun. Okay, that's a complex question because are you asking which wildflowers work best in containers? Uh, or are you asking uh, which ones make cut flowers? Because that, that's a cross section. Um, that's a very fine tuned um, request. I, I think to be fair, I would have to look that up. Um, and it would also depend more than anything on the depth of the container, the depth of the container. Um, um, so Rebecca has also added, I tried Gallardia and it is all floppy. Floppy as a cut flower or in the garden? I'm not clear. Um, I, think I, was growing was it in, I was growing it in containers on my balcony and it's flopping over as it's growing. And I'm wondering if it's the wind. Yeah. It's a very windy balcony and whether wind. I can grow yeah. flowers for cutting in windy conditions or whether. That's tricky. That's, yeah, that's really, why I was really tricky. Yeah, that's, that's a particularly challenging situation that you mm -hmm. have there. Um, there are certain wildflowers that have much sturdier stems, but they tend to be much taller and not something you can grow in a container unless you had a, you know, a huge one. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was wondering, whether that combination of wind plus container was not a great one. It's Thanks. a tricky one Thank at you. best. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so if you have other questions, um, we are very responsive by email. Um, so if you go to wildflowerfarm.com and look around on the site there, as I said, there's so much information there. You can also order the book there and um, you can email us with questions and we're surprisingly quick. That's surprisingly quick. Thank you so much. Um, there's one more comment here. Such a delight to see your bright, smiling face amidst your spectacular wildflowers. I now have two to three new favorites to add. Whoops, I lost it. A couple more people popped on here uh, to add to your gardens, to the gardens I tend. Thank you. You're welcome. You're absolutely welcome. So if anyone has any other questions, email through their website. That would be wonderful. And thank you so much, um, Miriam. It was Very welcome. a pleasure. It was so informative. And you look amazing, as I mentioned earlier. It, you're in your element. So <laughs> thanks so much for sharing it with us. It's, it's great to, uh, to be in touch with everybody. And uh, you're very welcome. I, I, I miss everybody. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, safely be together uh, soon. You know, we're doing all the right things. So we'll just keep up the good work. Absolutely. We're getting a lot of thank yous on here. So <laughs> you're very welcome. Terrific. Very I'm going to buy thank the you. book. Wonderful talk. Many thanks. You're very welcome. So take You're care, welcome. everybody. Thanks again, Miriam. I'll be in touch. And okay. be safe. Bye-bye. Have a great evening. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody.